Well, one of the things that struck us in the production of this book has been the incredible love for Barcelona from its fans, its worldwide fan base. Um, we've had amazing feedback from readers around the world. Um, Graham gets feedback all the time from, from people on Twitter, uh, people in the street who want to interact and find out more about the club. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to take some of your questions, address them to Graham. Uh, the book's been out about a week. Um, this is the first event. We're sitting in the Arches in Glasgow, which is an amazing atmospheric venue. It's so atmospheric that you can actually hear a band playing in the background, but it's all part of the experience. So anyway, this is the opportunity for you, the fans, to ask Graham the questions that you want to ask him. We put out a request on Twitter last night. We've had some fantastic questions in. So without any further ado, we'll just we'll turn to that. Graham, um, we've got a question from Chris Clements, uh, and he's asking which match from Barca's past would you have loved to attend and why? Hi, Chris. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I've been lucky enough to have seen a lot of them. I guess the, the immediate one to go to would probably be one that's talked about in the book when Cruyff asks us what well, Cruyff having arrived at the start of the 1973-74 season and Barca at the beginning of that season in a pre-season tournament lose to Real Madrid or uh, maybe draw at home. Um, they're not looking all that tasty. They haven't won the league uh, regularly in the previous decades. Um, Madrid are as much of a thorn in Barcelona's side then um, as now. And Cruyff has, has signed in a long protracted deal um, which has cost him a million euros. Transacted by what is claimed to be, and I can't prove this, the first ever football agent, which is Dennis Roach, who was a carpet salesman. So in other words, the new Arigosaki. Uh, it was a shoe salesman, so just in case anybody picks me up there. But I, generically, you get where I'm going. And they met on the beach, and Dennis Roach started talking football with Cruyff, represented him, and, and saw through this amazing million dollar deal, uh, which was protracted. And during the build up to the deal, um, the president of Ajax, without Cruyff's knowledge, which was an act of flagrant provo provocation given that the, the president of Ajax knew exactly how contrary. Uh, which means stubborn if anyone doesn't know Scottish uh, Cruyff is. He sold him without his knowledge to Real Madrid, which was just a kiss of death. <laughs> Cruyff was like, Cruyff, Cruyff would have given up football. Cruyff would probably, uh, I'm speaking from my point of view, I've signed for Real Madrid quite happily if the deal had been done by, you know, with his involvement, but it wasn't. So he was furious, um, dug his heels in, and eventually managed to get to move to Barcelona under Rinus Michels, who had been his tutor at, at Ajax. So in theory, it was perfect. Trophy-wise, the deal eventually did not end up all that well. But by the February of that first Cruyff season, um, it was the away match, it was at the Bernabeu, and um, I think it was something like February 12th or 13th, and they knew that this was to be uh, the birthday for their, for their child. And Cruyff said to his, his wife, um, would you mind making a, a planned cesarean section rather than a natural birth so that we can time it a week in advance so I can play? Which, um, again, like so many things we've discovered in this book, if that had gone wrong or if, if Cruyff had ended up being thrashed and humiliated in this game, then his wife would have legitimately been saying, well, you know, why have I changed one of the great events in our life ever for a game of football. But she did. They go to the Bernabeu. Cruyff is excellent. The team is very good, but Cruyff is excellent. They win 5-0. And although there have been a number of mutual 5-0s where Real Madrid have achieved exactly the same, the recent game that we focus on in the Pep Guardiola era when it's 5-0 at the Camp Nou has echoes back to that game in spring uh, 1974. And it was epoch-making. Many, many players, many uh, of the people who govern the club, Rosé, Laporta, talk about that as their Eureka moment, yeah. or as, um, I don't know who calls it, their old Eureka moment. It's an Alan Partridge book, isn't it? Yeah. Their old Eureka moment. And um, I suspect that in the context of talking about this book, that's probably the one, with one proviso. The guy I don't know enough about, but idolised from what I do know about, is Pep Samitier this uh, larger-than-life, nightlife-loving, brilliant, flamboyant centre-forward who um, dressed like sort of Flanagan and Allen or James Cagney when he was off the pitch. I'd love to have seen one of the great games he played in. 
There's a fantastic quote yeah. at the front of one of the chapters, which is from Pep Guardiola, and he says, the one thing that will always endure at this club is the Cantera. Um, there's a, a theme of the, the Barca DNA throughout the book. Uh, in that context, this is a, a really nice question from Christopher. Um, if Messi had signed for another team in his youth, would he still have gone on, to, gone on to become the best player in the world? Christopher? I don't know. Um, and although I take my work seriously and I've done a lot of research and I've, I've asked a lot of people, I think it was stupid of me to say definitely yes, definitely no. The, 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 way, you can st the way that anybody watching this or wanting to know the answer to Christopher's question can, can understand it is that Barcelona hadn't imbued Messi with any of the skills you see now. They've trained him in some of the um, team play. They, they nurtured him at an age where physically and mentally it was vital that he, he, he received the contributions that they gave him. Everybody I think now knows what was once a hidden story about him needing um, hormonal help to, to grow to his full height, to speed up that growth process. But also, um, I think that when if you speak to his coaches or to Gerard Pique or it says, he landed in a, an exceptional generation. He landed amongst a group of players who, who knew that they were destined to be great, who, who were committed to excellence, who won re regularly and who weren't lazy about their talents. He also landed amongst a generation of coaches and, and players who did that to him, who loved him as a person. They, they, they found him charming and um, increasingly funny. They wanted to bring him out of his shell because he was very, very timid and quiet. Um, and, and the club as well did provide a, a concept of what was useful for Messi that, that you would be taught. You'd, one, he was, his, his innate skills were given a license. Even at Barcelona, he has talked in an interview that I did with him about having to push aside certain coaches at Barcelona who tried to change him. Maybe harness him would, would be, or put him in shackles would be the, the way that, to explain what he was trying to get across. But broadly, Barcelona was a club that quite quickly recognised that if they built the team, the existing team concept, the team structure at each age level, which as you pointed out, is a consistent thing. If they engineered it towards making him shine and promoting him quickly, even above his physical attributes or his age, then we'd see the real Messi. And then this, this goes on a little bit further from what Christopher was asking, but um, later on, when his body was starting to become prone to tears and, and his muscles were, were not coping with his acceleration, the demands placed on him, all that kind of stuff, they, they, they had a very strategic method to teach him about diet, about health, about sleep, rest, recuperation, and they gave him a very specific physical trainer to work with him. So that's moving on from what Christopher was asking, but I think there's very little question that at almost every level, he landed at the right place in the right time. One of the things you tend to find about great teams under great managers is the manager inspires the players in that team to go into coaching themselves. It happened obviously with the great Sir Alex Ferguson, the Aberdeen team who are very close to your heart. It's happened with his Manchester United teams through the, the years as well. Um, this is a question from Sid Lyons. He's asking um, who in the current squad are good candidates to go on and manage Barcelona in the future? That's Sid. Sid Lyons. Sid. Um, I, I'm not taking a cop out here, Sid, by giving you the, the, the obvious answer, which is Xavi. Xavi has, has, Xavi shares a football intelligence with Pep Guardiola, which is, again, part innate, part trained, and, and he's an avaricious learner, um, which I think, when you do the job I do, and, and you're given the opportunities of access that I've been given, you find out that many great footballers um, can do it, but don't necessarily know how they do it. Then there's another group who can analyse what they're doing, but and, and therefore have a mental understanding as well as a, this physical innate ability to do things, whether it's exceptional things or, or basic things that make them professional footballers. And then there's a final group that can do it, know how they do it, and that can also communicate it, and who command respect. And Xavi Hernandez is one of those. And allied to that, he's got a, a, an ambition um, to, to coach, to stay in football. And therefore, 
I fully expect him at one stage not only to be a successful coach, but probably the coach of Barcelona. It's widely expected that his his cycle will include finishing playing, maybe taking a slight rest, doing his badges or increasing those badges that he hasn't taken already. And there's a real, that's another thing, there's a real uh, culture in Spain which goes ahead of the UK about how important it is to take all your badges to the highest level to learn, put it into practice. And they value that more than experiential learning. It's not that they put experiential learning down, but they, they want to be excellent and they want to have been taught how to teach, taught how to coach before they begin to practice, which is, we, we don't, we, we, in this country we've traditionally said, if you're good enough, we'll just throw you straight in, you'll take the cage, you'll, and then if you get your badges, you get your badges. That's changing, but it's a culture in Spain. So without any doubt, um, that's one. Uh, Messi, no chance. Um, Piquet has definitely got the same abilities as Xavi and an even more forceful personality. Um, but he's already said that he, he views himself going down the presidential route rather than the, the coach's route. And um, I wouldn't like to say about Iniesta, I'm, I'm unclear. He's got so many other interests in his life already, including his uh, vineyard and his wine production that he takes great satisfaction from that I don't know. Um, instinctively, I would say Sergio Busquets. Uh, because of personality, because of communicative ability and because of how he reads the game and because of his need to stay in the game, his father's a coach. I, I believe that's going to be inherent in him. The most iconic game of Barcelona's season last year was undoubtedly Wembley. Um, the first chapter of the book is dedicated to the road to Wembley. Um, this question nicely taps into that. Um, it's from Jeff Stewart. And Jeff asks, if Barca and Man United swapped Messi and Rooney, would Barca still have won La Liga and the Champions League last season? If they swapped Messi and Rooney. Well, Jeff, I'm going to take it that what you mean is that they swapped them at an early stage, not just before the final, I think. Or how do you take Jeff's question? Immediately yeah. before the final? Well, um... value for money. Two answers, Jeff. Um, at a young age, my respect for Manchester United is such. Uh, and my knowledge of the way Sir Alex Ferguson works, that if they had been bringing through uh, Leo Messi, um, I think Manchester United would have been equally clever about his development, about how to build around him, where to use him on the pitch, how to make him feel comfortable. Now that wouldn't automatically have given Manchester United a generation of Xavi and Iniesta and Puyol and Piquet. But they're a club who would have known how to um, exploit his riches and therefore if I'm right that you're meaning if they got these two players at an early stage I think we'd have seen a still more threatening Manchester United for the rest of Europe I, I'm pretty sure that we would have seen players bought around Messi to complement him um, so you make a good case and Rooney at, at um, Truthfully, I'm not clear that if Rooney had gone to Barcelona at a young age, if you take all the, the it's a hypothetical thing, so if you take all the original cultural things apart, when, when Rooney came through, he was very bull-like, very bullish. He, he found it harder to naturally control certain instincts. Um, in this instance, I'm talking in a sporting sense. And I, I'm not sure there would have been so much tolerance and understanding um, shown from at Barcelona, which is quite a conservative club in some of the, let's say, the, the, the temper issues or the physical play, and they might have wasted their resource. Um, so in the scenario you paint, as I've understood it, it would have been no harm to Wayne Rooney at all, it would have been an advantage to Manchester United patently. Just before the final, <laughs> um, if, it had been in the, if it had been in the month before the final and you were allowed to swap players like that. Um, maybe, a, maybe a way to answer that was that I came out of the, the Wembley final with huge, huge respect for Rooney because I think it had annoyed him how, how small a part he played in the Rome final um, how Manchester United were so easily quenched in the Rome final they, they couldn't get the ball I suspect they knew they were playing against the Barcelona side which was not at full strength and he has to have 60% fitness wasn't allowed to shoot in case it just tore his thigh muscle completely um, Abidal was banned, Alves was banned, 
Um, Silvini was playing what was only his 10th or 12th game of the season, aged 35-ish. It was unusual for them for us to see Toure at centre-back. And, and yet Barcelona didn't look threatened. And I think that bugged Rooney sufficiently in the Wembley game. I, I thought he gave, gave a performance of real leadership because as the game developed, his team was still second best. But aside from the goal, his work rate, his intention to do damage, um, his, his acceptance of responsibility was, was of the Barcelona ilk, there's no doubt. And therefore, maybe the question remains about how Barca would cope with facing Messi. Um, and I asked both Mascherano and Abidal in the week leading up to when the game about facing Messi in training and if they could draw any conclusions about what United should do. And neither of them wanted to help United by explaining too much in that answer, but both of them said that it's hell on earth facing him even in training games. So would Manchester United have beaten Barcelona um, if they had Messi, not Rooney? I... I don't know. I don't know. It's a brilliant question. And um, I think Barcelona would still win La Liga. If Rooney was there and playing and firing and all cylinders, that creates side by side them. Definitely they'd have won. That's the easy part of the question, Gordon. They'd have won La Liga. Who would have won the Champions Cup? Score draw. And you imagine what would have happened in extra time. OK, from, from the start of this project, there's been a, a strong musical theme um, from ourselves in a karaoke bar. The, in neither Neil behind the camera, nor Martin here. Neither of them could sing. By the book, you'll find out. Absolutely. Um, but there's also plenty of musical references in the book. Um, you're a music buff, you've got a great passion for it. So this is a perfect question for you, I think. And it's from our good friend Jazza Gold. Um, star. She's a star. She's a star. She's a star. Pick a song for every player that gets a chapter in the book. Whoa, every player gets a chapter in the book, right? Remind me who gets a chapter in the book. Let's start with the odd start. couple. Um, whoa, I'm going to be cheesy here. I, I would not put it on my turntable, but PK's obviously got to be granted. Hips don't lie. It's obviously got to be Shakira, who's a wonderful influence in his life, and they're very happy together. So that's that's an uplifting thought. That's brilliant. Puyol um, has to be Guns N' Roses. I've no idea what, what Puyol listens to. Um, but it's got, I can imagine him with his axe in hand going absolutely mental somewhere in Pasadena in a massive gig. Guns N' Roses, I don't know which track. We'll go for Paradise City. So we'll go for Paradise City, uh, which Barcelona is for him. Who else gets a chapter now? Xavi. Xavi, what would you... Xavi oh. might have something off... Um, if you could find a hybrid of the Stax record label or... What do you call it? What do you call that beautiful jazz record label? From is it Blue Tone? No, that's not quite right. Javi, Javi moves to a, a Nina Simone, my baby just cares for me beat. You know that 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 shuffle on the drums with the stuff you use for baking, making pastries and all that kind of stuff. You know the little brushes and the drums. It's all elegance and sway and smooth. It's like listening to velvet unfolding, isn't it? Or, or, or liquid gold, you know, being poured out when you watch Javi play. So. Um, whoever wrote the, the, the music to my baby don't care for me, that's the kind of music that Xavi would have and that's what he plays to. Iniesta, I mean I think it... Iniesta, probably another girl, another planet, I think. Is that the only ones? Uh, Messi. Lisa. Hold on a sec, you can't duck a question like that, listen. Isn't that was the, this is live, okay, so... <laughs> another girl, another planet, was that the only ones? Messi. Uh, I think it's the only one, so... If you, haven't, if you haven't heard Another Girl, Another Planet, put that on. And the next time will just pop up, like, you know, um, who is the one where you used to rub the lantern and the genie? Eh? I Dream of Genie, that was it. You rub the lantern and genie pops up. That's what happened. You put that song on, Iniesta will pop up in your living room. Okay. Who else gets another chapter? Come on, I'm into this now. Well, we mentioned the whole team. Uh, Leo Messi. Part. Leo Messi gets a chapter. Messi is Messi's got two chapters dedicated to him. Two songs uh, then, there's so no there's doubt. Two songs. Um, I think when Messi plays, oof, that's a difficult one. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something fast. I, I'm thinking because I wasn't allowed to, to get this in the book, um, and I wasn't, you have to admit, I would think um, the undertones, the teenage kicks, uh, because when those, when, that, when those guitars explode and Fergal singing, it's like, you know, just messy bursting away from the, the tackle. And the other one might be uh, Revolution, the Beatles, you know? Because, uh, again, it's all raw power and that's what he's caused. And one for Pep um, would probably be, um, I'm, I'm thinking the, the, the end credits, um, no, not the end credits, I'm thinking something from the Blade Runner soundtrack. Something sort of uh, intense and mournful but all-knowing. So, Blade Runner. Perfect. Is that it? That's it. Jazz of Gold, Julie Tops. Excellent. Well, Graham, thanks very much for answering these questions. It goes without saying that if you would like the answers to more of your questions, then all you need to do <laughs> is spend £12.99 on this marvellous book and it'll tell you everything you need to know. Thank you. Do you not do the Dave Allen bit here? I may or God go with you. <laughs>